Today, we are going to discuss about uh, the concept of normativity and its association with the speech act. We have already discussed about Schiffer's intention based semantics and we had stopped our discussion at uh, this point that how morality and prudentiality are part of the intention based semantics. When we analyze the concept of meaning, we need to see where the speaker induces normative elements when he or she is engaged in performing speech acts. Speech is a performative activities. Whenever we speak, we consider speaking or making a statement is a performative act. This has been theorized by Searle following Austin. We have discussed that. Specifically today, we need to understand how the normative element comes into the discourse of speech act. In that context, it is through normativity, the intention based semantics tries to approach the concept of truth. So, normative reason in a sense supports or works as a truth supporting reason. So, in that context, Schiffer says when intentionally expressed statements, speaker is imposing an intention in the expression. So, it is not the case the speaker just imposes the meaning on it, rather the utterance also involve certain values. So, there Sir brings in the notion of commitment and obligation. When the speaker utters a statement, for example, the statement of promise, I promise that I would lend you 100 rupees. This promise involves a sense of commitment and obligation. The moment the speaker utters this particular statement, he means what he says, what he is committing and he tries to fulfill this promise. So, promise making as a kind of an intentional action shows that the speaker is not only inducing a kind of a special meaning to it, but also expressing commitment and obligation. So, commitment and obligation are the normative element attached to the linguistic representation that has been made through several performative expressions like promise, order, assertions, etcetera. Now, Schiffer says and agrees with this idea of intention based semantics argued by Searle and Austin, but he further his thesis referring to this point that the statement has a emotional or affective attitude and there is an intentional attitude. So, there are two kinds of attitudes that the statement exhibits. One is that the emotional attitude, the affective attitude and the rational intentional attitude of the speaker. Because when the speaker says or utters a promise, he knows what is being said. He is aware of this fact that he is making the statement, he is also aware of this fact that he is committed to do certain things. So, the sense of commitment is the result of some kind of a rational deliberation. So, intentional attitude involves rational thinking. So, when we say that speech is a kind of a special kind of intentional act, we 
also presuppose this fact that it is a rational or deliberate action. In that sense, making a promise or an assertion is nothing but expressing our decisions or judgment about the particular case. So, in that sense, Schiffer little differs from the Gracian framework, which he says in the Gracian framework, we fail to distinguish this motive and emotion. The motivating factors for intentional actions or making or forming the motivating factor of the speech act and the emotional factor that is attached with it. Schiffer intention based semantics also refers to this idea that the semantics is compositional in nature, where the compositional aspect in the serious communicating circumstances, the speaker's intention is not only a subjective factor in bringing out the effect in the audience, rather the circumstance itself is an important and unchallengeable condition in bringing out the effect. So, Schiffer at the beginning tries to show that meaning can be analyzed with reference to certain conditions and that is what he called the communicating circumstance in which both speaker and hearer are participating. And this condition has nothing to do with the habit and practices. So, meaning for Schiffer is not conventional the way Grais has understood it or the way Saul would construe it. The Saulian interpretation to this intention by semantics is precisely to argue that meaning is conventional and meaning is been intentionally composed by the speaker. This very fact that the speaker induces the meaning also implies this that the speaker is trying to compose a kind of a content that is embedded in the statement. So, Searle is in favor of arguing out a thesis called the compositional notion of semantics, whereas Schiffer and others would agree with the compositional notion of semantics, but slightly in a different way. We would like to see how does Schiffer differ from or disagrees with Grice. Firstly, for S that is the speaker, X may have some meaning other than P. So, it cannot be as policy to utter X only if he wants some A to think as things that P. Now, Schiffer is questioning the very intention of the speaker. How is it the case that such a coordination takes place? The Gracian intention based semantics does not explain this coordination between the speaker and the hearer. Hence, there is a difficulty that Schiffer is raising here. Secondly, S may have some other utterance type by which he also means that P. So, it cannot be as policy to utter X if he wants some A to think that P. So, in this context we cannot generalize this fact that the speaker X generalize this fact that the speaker S cannot have a subjective policy. Now, this intentional expressions when made by the speaker does not imply that the meaning is subjective. 
but according to Schiffer, Schiffer's criticism, one can get this impression that the Gracian and the Serlian understanding of meaning, particularly the intention based semantics gives an impression of the fact that meaning is subjective, but that is not the case. For Schiffer, IBS the intention based semantic involves no subjective imposition of meaning in the conventional means of communication, rather the speaker and hearer must have or share some kind of a mutual beliefs or knowledge, they must be aware of each other and that awareness that knowledge that is common to the speaker and hearer will help us explaining the coordination that prevails between them. Otherwise, what the speaker says and what the hearer will understand, how does the hearer know that speaker means this not that. Whenever speakers utters P, he means X not Y. So, this coordination is possible, the hearer would perfectly understand what the speaker means provided they share some common ideas or knowledge and thereby the coordination is possible. So, the perfect coordination or what you call the self perpetuating regularity condition in fact, talks about a strategic interdependence to regulate agents goal oriented behavior. In fact, Schiffer further introduces the notion of coordination equilibrium to standardize that what is is usually being expected whenever the speaker utters P. So, that should be a kind of a standard okay, an acceptable standard what he calls the coordination equilibrium to talk about to analyze the intentional meaning that is being imposed on a particular statement whenever something is said. He further says that meaning is not conventional rather meaning can be analyzed through certain cognitive functions. Now, the emergence of new conventions, new practices, new orders would definitely be a hindrance and Schiffer says that should not be an hindrance provided we work out meaning from a psychological point of view or following a psychological model. So, Schiffer ultimately argues for a psychological model of meaning which replaces the conventional model. So, this idea that the new convention or the emergence of a new convention would create conflict so far as this intention based semantics is concerned because again and again bringing this coordination equilibrium will be a will be a tough task because that is grounded on practice or the notion of shareability, how the speaker and hearer or a community says a particular knowledge, particular belief. So, therefore, Schiffer tries to draw our attention to the fact that a psychological model would help us better explaining the intentional based semantics. Therefore, he argues that we can replace the conventional notion of meaning through the psychological model. Convention has been defined by psychological and non semantic terms. So, Schiffer's notion of convention or the conventional meaning is to be defined 
with the help of certain psychological elements as well as with the help of certain non semantic elements. Now, what is non semantic about Schiffer's intention based semantics? And what is psychological about Schiffer's intention based semantics, particularly the psychological model that he is bringing into the discourse of meaning. Now, when we try to read Schiffer's argument, one can very well imagine about the status of intentionality present in meaning. So, what would be the status of intentionality in this case? Whether intentionality remains as a psychological phenomenon or it is a non psychological phenomenon. So, the intentional attitude of the speaker is caused by what Schiffer says the propositional attitude of the mental states. So, intentionality is in a sense connected with the propositional attitudes of certain mental or cognitive states. Schiffer does not want to understand the notion of intentionality or the intentional attitude of the speaker referring to the conventional uses of language. So, it is the linguistic form of life for Schiffer does not help to explain the intentional attitude. So, language per se is not autonomous rather language is in fact, dependent on the function of human cognition or the function of human mind. Searle also argues that as I have said earlier according to Searle language is an institution created by the intentional attitude of the human beings. In other words, it is intentionality through which we can explain the function of language in our everyday life. Intentionality is prior to language. Schiffer on the other hand comes closer to the Searlian thesis, but in a very different way argues that intentionality is not an independent property, rather intentionality is exhibited by the function of certain cognitive states or the propositional attitude of mental states. So, the structural explication is formed by micro constituents and these micro constituents are words on the one hand and the syntactical mechanism that is operating in our brain. So, syntax or what you call the grammar determines the language. The grammar is, is part of the cognition and one the, the function of the function of this cognitive states determines the function of the language because expressions are when you talk about linguistic expressions expressions are product of the cognitive function of human mind. This function the cognitive function happens in a particular way. The logic of this cognitive function shows that there is an order, there is a structure 
there is a grammatical structure which is involved in the in producing or making this linguistic activities possible. Hence, for Schiffer, the sentence of L, suppose L is one kind of sentence, is nothing but the sentence of G. So, the sentence of L will presuppose that is a sentence of G. So, in that sense, the meaning of whatever been said in this particular sentence, the meaning of the sentence L is connected with the meaning that is there in the mind. So, in that sense, whenever we talk about understanding, knowing as a kind of a cognitive activities, those cognitive activities can be accommodated as a part of the function of the mind. So, when I listen to your promise or promise of the speaker, I understand that this is promise not an order or what does the speaker mean when he utters this particular statement. So, understanding or knowing are very much part of the cognitive activities, it is related to cognition. Hence, the linguistic component is part of the propositional attitude and there are also certain non-semantic functions involved and those non-semantic functions refer to the grammar that is the grammar of thought. So, see for in this connection comes very close to Fodder. Now, let us read Schiffer. Schiffer says to know meaning of mental representation S is to know what one believes when S is sorted in one as belief where one believes that the content of one's belief is conveyed by that clauses of belief predicates true. So, that is what the propositional attitude is not only exhibiting the intentional element present in the sentence, but also can explain how a sentence is formed, how a sentence is being composed by the speaker and what are the cognitive elements involved in composing the sentence or the expression. So, there are both psychological element and there are also non semantical element preferably for see for it is the grammar which is primary condition for formulating the sentence. Hence, the Seifer's compositional semantics comes close to Fodor's understanding of language of thought or Somsky's notion of a universal grammar, because all these philosophers of language try to analyze meaning with reference to certain mental features and they all emphasize that it is the grammar which is primary, it is the grammar which is non semantic. Now, one of the reasons why Seifer is talking about a non semantic analysis of the semantics is precisely because Seifer finds the Gracians have given a circular explanation of meaning. He says, if you would like to have an intention based semantics and it can be well argued without giving primacy to the semantics. Okay. 
So, therefore, a non circular explication of intentional content of an expression is possible and it is possible precisely with reference to this kind of model. The grammatical states belief states which are propositionally expressible are grammatical states which are non linguistic mental states. They are not entirely linguistics. Following Schiffer, Lohr argues, Brain Lohr argues that a non linguistic account of content provides an alternatively flexible basis of basis for sketching the manifold possible dependencies of thought upon language. The key point is that the ascription of content to propositional attitude is more abstract level than the ascription of meaning to the natural language. The point is if my functional account of belief individuation is correct, intentions are not required in the theory of propositional attitudes and their intentional properties. So, it is without those intentional properties, one can individuate the speaker's belief or what does the speaker mean when he or she expresses a particular statement. So, their expressions are caused by certain propositional attitudes or mental states and those mental states are pre linguistic mental states or what we can call it non linguistic mental states. The content is not part of that. One can also suggest that the content is, is explained with reference to those cognitive functions of the mental states. Lohr talks about the functional correlationship and plasticity. He says more and more beliefs states can be written in the brain, hence the function is plastic, hence the function is expandable, it is not limited by this fact the function is expandable in the sense that more and more beliefs can be incorporated to this cognitive chamber and hence this notion of plasticity. So, far as this functional correlationship is concerned, they try to draw some kind of relationship between the neural structure of the brain and the grammatical structure of this cognitive states. Now, this causal relationship between these two states, the neurological functional states and the syntactically connected cognitive states are important to explain the intentional content of a statement. Hence, both Lohr and Schiffer would argue in favor of psychofunctional semantics, precisely because the psychofunctional analysis of meaning is non circular. We are not ex trying to explain meaning through a intentionality. Intention is not a primary factor to explain intentional meaning, thus it is non circular. Rather what is important is that the functional correlationship between the neural structure of the brain and the grammatical structure of the cognitive states, the syntactic states, how the syntactic states are formed and the how they are been connected to the neurons and the neural circuits and how their function helps in producing a statement 
which is intentional one. So, this information processing model is, is in fact eliminating the notion of experience, the notion of consciousness precisely because such a model can be analyzed accepting the functional theory of mind and we have already discussed how functional theory of mind reduces the conscious experience to certain neural functions of the brain. Now, the urge here is this not to reduce consciousness, not to give this idea of experience from the discourse of meaning, but to bring them back and see how intention based semantics plays an important role in our everyday life. And such model is been argued out by John Searle. Now, Searle's intention based semantics does emphasize on this fact that intentionality is an intrinsic feature of the mind and the mind is conscious. And when the speaker is making a commitment, expressing a promise or giving an order, the speaker must mean what he says. Now, this idea of meaning goes very well with experience, because whatever is being said by the speaker is being experienced. So, speaking as a kind of a special speech act, the special form of speech act is an action also has a kind of a intention in action, because the speaker while speaking also means what is being said. So, meaning something cannot eliminate experience, rather speaking is an intentional action, it is a self reflexive action, it is a deliberate action, hence it is part of our thinking. So, intentional representation on intention based semantics meaning is in fact connected with mind, but it is not disconnected with with convention either. So, it is not disconnected. So, meaning is not entirely a kind of a intentional meaning is entirely intentional. So, far as the relationship of intentionality with human mind is concerned and it is not entirely internal, it is intentional and not entirely internal, meaning thereby it is part of the convention, the practice, the uses of language. So, there is the linguistic form of life, the linguistic form of life is something which is important for Searle. So, Searle tries to show that meaning is internal as well as it is external, it is part of the convention, hence it is external. It is being imposed by an intentional mind by the speaker or the intentional mind of the speaker or an intentional subject. Hence, there is some kind of internality attached to it. 
over and above to mean something is to experience the content of your statement. So, in that sense the association of language or linguistic activities are part of the mental activities, but it is not entirely governed by the mental activities, it is certainly external. Sir does talk about the concept of background ability, which is this is a physical or a dispositional ability of the biological and it makes that intentional representation possible. The intentional representation is made possible through a non intentional power, a non intentional ability and what Sal calls the background ability. The background is biological. Sal says it is there in the mind, but we cannot completely characterize it as conscious or physical. It is biologically evolved power, because according to Searle consciousness itself is being biologically evolved. So, Searle is not characterizing the conscious intentional attitude of human beings as something mental in a Cartesian sense. Rather, he wants to show that it is that physical capacity, the physical power which makes intentional representation possible. So, he holds on to a physical ontology, but he also suggests that the normative element like commitment and obligation is not intrinsic to the physical ability of the brain, rather it is intrinsic to human consciousness. So, intentional representations particularly the linguistic representations okay, whether it is mental or it is in the form of language, whether it is in the form of thought or in the form of language or linguistic expressions. For Searle the content is isomorphic, then the normative element which I am trying to bring in very briefly is to show that how human consciousness has kind of a deontic force. He says human consciousness has a deontic force, deontic power of human intentionality as Sal would put it. The deontic power of human intentionality is important in this sense because it is through this form of intentionality human beings have constituted institutions, human beings have built up institutions. So, the creation of any institutions is possible with the help of this reflective attitude of intentionality or what Sal calls a self a referential feature of intentionality. So, intentionality or intentional activities are self referential. In the case of speech act whenever somebody is saying something, he means that, he experiences that. So, what is being desired to speak or what is being intended to speak by the speaker is being also experienced and it is that experiential component shows that intentionality or intentional activities are self referential activities.
So, it is this self referential intentional activities helps in formulating what shall call constitutive rules. The rules which are in this form called we mean x as y in the context c. x is meant as y in the context c. So, this is what is the logical form of constitutive rules. So, it is through constitutive rules institutions are formed. So, human normative activities is very much associated with the function of institutions. We consider P as promise which has been defined by an institu institutional structure that yes, this kind of statement will be considered as promise, not as an order. So, it is the institutional which defines the meaning of the expression. So, meaning thereby is a rule governed activities. So, conventions are rule governed. Let me briefly talk about the literal meaning. The literal meaning determines the conditions absolutely in isolation, but literal meanings are vague and literal descriptions are always incomplete. Greater precision and completeness are added by supplementing literal meaning with collateral assumptions and expectations. So, Searle does not give importance to literal meaning. He says literal meaning in themselves are incomplete. Hence, intentional semantics needs to be bring into the discourse of meaning. So, the linguistic, so the development of linguistic categories and the ability, the intentional abilities of human beings are to be taken into consideration. And for that, we need to talk about the conventions, the uses of a particular concepts or categories and experience that is experiencing the meaning of the statement and which is very much part of an conscious intentional attitude of the speaker. And I have already talked about self reflexivity or self referentiality that how we do we modify certain things, how do we formulate a constitutive rules. So, and we have already discussed about the structural isomorphism. So, in that context, we have also referred to how meaning is external, that is how do we behave linguistically in the world. So, the linguistic field is an intentional field. It is a field which is connected to the mind. Mind is not in isolation because mind is, is experiencing things. The speaker is also an experiential subject. So, language and mind are very neatly connected. They are connected by the principle of intentionality. Hence, in the discourse of intention based semantics, we cannot, cannot rule out the significance of the mind and consciousness. With this, I conclude the discourse on intention based semantics. Thank you.